In this video, I'm going to show some basics of writing autonomous programs. First, open up Android Studio and open up the FTC app that we installed in a previous video. Then, if the file tree isn't open, click on the Project button on the left. Then, navigate to where your code is. We need to make a new file for our autonomous program. And the fastest way to do that is probably just to copy my first op mode. Now we can see that I've copy pasted my first op mode and named it Tutorial Autonomous. Name your file something useful. The next thing we should do is change the comment at the top so that way it describes what the program does. Once you change the comment, we should update the registration annotations. We're not making a teleop file, but we're instead we're making an autonomous file. So you can change it from at teleop to at autonomous. And then we can also change the name of it so that way we know what we're choosing in the future. Make sure that yours doesn't have the at disabled annotation, because if you do, then you won't be able to see the program when you're choosing an op mode. I'm going to leave the disabled in there because I don't need to see it when I'm choosing an op mode. Once we've done that, there's one more thing to set up. Scroll down to the bottom of the file, and in the main method, there should be a main while loop. If you want to, and I recommend you do so, delete the entire loop. That makes it so you don't have to make a complicated state machine loop. And that's all the setup done. Now from here, we can do the same thing we do for every other file. We need to first declare and then initialize our hardware. For my example, I'm just going to pretend that I have a robot with two drive motors and one arm servo. Make sure you declare your hardware in a similar way. And make sure you give all of your hardware useful names so that you'll remember them in the future. Try to avoid using names like Motor1 and Motor2 because that has no description to it. Once we declare the hardware, we need to initialize it within the main method. Now we can see I've initialized all my hardware. Make sure you initialize your hardware in a similar fashion, but tailor them to your needs. There's also one more thing you may want to put in your initialization, and that is to set your servos to certain positions. So you might initialize the servos sort of like that. Make sure that all of your initialization code goes above the wait for start line, and any code that you want the robot to actually run, make sure it goes below the wait for start line. So now we're ready to start writing code for the robot. However, before we do so, we need to think about what we want the robot to do. Try to think of all of the aspects for your program, and think about every step your robot is going to take along the way. Consider things like where the robot's going to start, where the robot needs to go, how the robot needs to get there, what the robot needs to do once it gets there, and things like that. I recommend you draw a path that you want your robot to drive along, similar to the way I've done so here. Mark where your robot is going to start on the field, the path it needs to follow in order to get to the objective, and then what it needs to do with the objective. In my example, my robot starts in the bottom right, and then it's going to go forward, turn left, continue forward, then turn right, and then continue forward to the objective, and then it'll stop at the objective and do something there. Then it becomes very easy to write the code for your robot. You know what it needs to do, so you can just do it. Once you've drawn the path that you want your robot to follow, try to write the code that will make your robot follow the path. I will do so as well. So I've written my code, however, it's in a very bad form that I recommend you don't write in. This code is really big, and it's hard to understand what is happening, and it's hard to understand why things are happening. That's actually why I had to put in these comments. However, we can improve on this using methods. I'll show an example method. Here's my method that I'm going to use. It's very easy to understand what my method does because I've given it a useful name. In this instance, drive forward. Make sure that you give your methods useful names as well. So now what I can do in the code is anytime the robot is driving forward, I can replace it with that method I just created. So that would look something like this. At this point, we can also delete the comments we have above the drive forward methods because they say exactly the same thing. So now you can see my code is getting a little bit shorter. We can make methods for every function that the robot does, such as controlling the drive system or controlling manipulators on the robot. Go ahead and make a bunch of methods that you think would be useful. I'll do the same. So now we can see I've created many more methods. All of them have been given useful names, so you don't need comments explaining what they do. Notice how some of my methods utilize other methods, such as my stop driving method. I've also created some methods for controlling my servo, down here. Once we've created a bunch of methods, we can implement them in our code above. Now we can see that my code is getting a lot smaller. I've also implemented one of my methods in the initialization here. We can also make the code shorter by combining the time methods with our driving methods. I'll show an example. And then we can see here that I've written those methods. I have drive forward time, turn left time, and turn right time. I will also mention that these methods have to throw interrupted exception, because the thread.sleep command can sometimes throw that exception. Then we can implement those in our code. And then we can see what that looks like. Hopefully you're starting to see the power of using methods. My code has gone from many lines of code that barely fit on the screen, down to just a few. It's also a lot easier to understand what I'm doing, because all of the methods have useful names which describe what they do. There's something else we should do to add clarity to our program. That is to remove magic numbers. A magic number is just a number in the code that has no meaning to it. For instance, this one that I'm passing into the drive forward time method. Another programmer wouldn't necessarily know what one means or why I'm choosing to use one. 
Instead, I can create a variable with a useful name to replace this one, such as this variable that I just defined down here. Instead of saying one, I can say drive power. Now it's more clear as to what I'm doing. There's another advantage to this, which is that if we want to change the drive power, we don't have to fish through all of our code to find every single time we want to change it. We can just change it once in the variable initialization. I also have a couple methods down at the bottom which use some magic numbers in them as well. I can just declare a couple variables which remove those magic numbers. And now it's more clear as to what's happening here. Continuing on, you may also think that we should replace these magic numbers for the time. However, sometimes it's easier to understand what the code is doing if you have the magic number in there. Discuss with your team whether or not you want to remove the time magic numbers. So now that we've done all that, let's compare our new code to the old code. Notice just how big the old code is compared to our new code. Our new code is also a lot easier to understand because we use methods that have useful names which describe what they do. I'll stop writing code now and let you write your own code. Let's just quickly review what we've done. We created a new file and set it up for autonomous. Then we declared and initialized our hardware and we thought about what we need our robot to do. Then we wrote the code that made our robot follow that path. The code we initially wrote was poorly written, so we improved it by utilizing a bunch of methods and removing the magic numbers. Hopefully all of that teaches you what you need to know in order to write a basic autonomous program for your robot. If you have any questions, be sure to post them in the comments below. I'm also going to quickly mention one more thing, which is that we can improve the functionality of our code by not using time and instead using sensors. I'm not going to talk about sensors in this video, but be sure to check out our future videos on using sensors. Until then, I will see you guys later. Goodbye.